go ahead and get started. <clears throat> Today what I'd like to do is talk about a different sort of modification of the standard single population model. And that is to allow for um, not just binary mergers in the coalescent gene genealogies, but to allow multiple mergers. And so there are certain circumstances in which that makes sense, depending on the reproductive biology of the species. And it also leads to some interesting different sorts of coalescent models that people have studied that are very different than the standard Kingman coalescent. Before I get going, I wanted to follow the end of the last lecture a little bit. <clears throat> I didn't say much about um, data or anything at that point, but I wanted to make a connection to something that people do all the time in population genetics, which is to use FST to estimate migration rate. And I'll give a pretty simple example of just the equations for that sort of thing. This goes back to Wright, Sewell Wright, a long time ago now. Thank you. And I think, Bruce, you've mentioned FST briefly. So FST can be written out this way. Um, HT minus HS over HT. So HT is the total population. Heterozygosity. So we're imagining a very large subdivided population, the Wright Island model, in fact, with a very large number of subpopulations. And this is the heterozygosity as if you took the entire collection of those subpopulations and measured uh, heterozygosity in that total population. HS is the average eh, within subpopulation heterozygosity. which would be gotten just by going to each subpopulation, checking the heterozygosity, and then taking the average. <clears throat> Wright also found, using um, analysis of the island model, that FST would be approximately equal to this formula using the parameters I defined last time. That's 4NM. And what one can do, uh, so this is like an, an approximate expectation for FST under the infinite or the island model with a large number of subpopulations. One can make these two things equivalent and solve for M in terms of H, S, and H, T, and you would get a formula like this one. And that would be an estimate of, F, of, of 4NM from data, where I would have calculated these things according to the allele frequency formulas that Bruce had put up um, uh, at the early part of the week. <clears throat> now, last, yesterday, you know, I derived from some formulas. For the average pairwise coalescence times within and between populations, Right? And what I didn't say, and I, I, I meant to say, but I just wanted to get through that selection model also, is that I can easily convert these into predictions for average numbers of pairwise differences within and between populations. So if I defined those things um, similarly to how we had done before, I'm going within my subpopulation sample and taking all pairwise differences. Right, and I could take an average of that over subpopulations um, if I wanted to. Um, and then between, take all pairs between populations, count the number of differences, take the average. The expected numbers of these things, right, remember um, you know, here's the situation we're in. We're looking at a pairwise coalescent time. And remember the rate of uh, mutation per unit of coalescence time is theta over 2, and there are two branches, and there's T. 
So if I take an expected value and the only random variable is t, I would just be multiplying these things by theta. And then I could do the same thing. Um, I could solve this equation for m. And then get a way of estimating from sequence data now. Uh, estimating this parameter for nm. And you can see the similarity here. They're very, very akin to each other. These are a little bit different quantities, right? These are um, probabilities of difference for the whole sequence. And these are the average numbers of pairwise differences. But the, the orientation that you're taking things in, either within and between, is the same. And the formula is the same. And they're basically the same thing. They would be pretty, they're extremely close if the mutation rate was super, super small. So if you used per site, uh, diversities here, it would be the same as per site heterozygosity. Yeah. Well, yes, it should be. <laughs> good. So that's a good point. So uh, I just said it, but um, we're in this world where D is large. <clears throat> so um, this over here uh, is the total as if you had, a, a, had taken the population, put it all in one bin and mixed it up, right? And over here, if I, if I wanted to calculate pi t, I would have to have some kind of average of pi w and pi b. But when, when d is large, if I take a random sample of two sequences, almost all the time, they're going to be between population samples. So that's the connection between b here and t over there. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Anyway, I just wanted to mention that uh, to make a connection to how data are analyzed. You know, when you plug some data into a program and it calculates for an M or just NM using sequence data, it's doing something like this. Right? All right. <clears throat> so now let me move on to these coalescent processes with multiple mergers. And I'm going to present um, some slides. There's a, there's a beautiful picture in here. That's why it's getting, you know, it's the end of the week. We need a beautiful picture. Yes. Um, you just line up two things and ask whether they're different. That's all. So you could do pairwise just like that. It's the probability if I take a sample of two things that they're different. And uh, Bruce expressed that in terms of allele frequencies. So I would have uh, 2p1 minus p for an allele in frequency. Right, and that's the chance that I sample two different alleles if I take two. Yep. Other questions? Good. All right, so this is um, a, kind of a modified version of a talk I've given um, a, a, a while ago, but it's put in some more stuff for this course. Um, and so it's, uh, I should say, before I get going, that this is work done uh, with two people who were in my group. Jarki Eldon was a, a graduate student with me and Ori Sargsian, a uh, postdoc. And they're both um, moved on to bigger and better things at this point. And the references are right there if you're interested in um, looking up some of these results. All right, so here's a picture that I, I flashed before when I gave a lecture. Um, and uh, it's a, just the standard coalescent we all know about. Um, the point I would make now is that the tree here um, has only these binary mergers uh, as I'm following lines backward in time, right? That's something that we derive for the Wright Fisher model, and it was certainly true there, right? In the limit as n goes to infinity. And also, I'll point out this distribution of coalescence times, which depends on I choose two when there are I lineages. Both of these things are going to change in this talk. So now we'll have a different distribution of times to between coalescent events and also trees that can have multiple mergers in them. Sorry? Oh, good, sorry. Um, this is in those models, like this one here, um, where we're keeping track of the number of offspring. This would be a haploid situation here. So this is the number of offspring of haploid individual or chromosome I. Um, then sigma is the variance of that number, but when n is large. Right. Yeah. 
and that was effective population size on the other side is proportional to, you know, n divided by sigma. All right, so here's the kind of model that um, one would start with, and uh, this a Wright Fisher model can be described this way, and so on. And we went through this already uh, a couple of times in the course. Here's another picture you've already seen. It's the allele frequency spectrum for a relatively small sample in humans. And, and it, like I said before, it fits pretty well, right? It's, it's not way, way off. And the basic reason for that is humans are not terribly subdivided. You know, if you calculate FST, you quoted one, I think, uh, Bruce, in your lecture. What's human FST? About 3%, right? So it's a little number. You'd get a large estimate of M for humans. And also, we humans, you know, we don't have a gigantic variance of offspring number. I'm going to consider a model in a minute in which an individual can have a huge number of offspring, potentially something comparable to um, the whole population size. Um, anyway, this is some data that I got just for example from the U.S. Census Bureau, and it's the number of offspring of uh, uh, females, a whole bunch of them, like 11 million, 11, uh, 11 and a half million, up to the almost entire reproductive age. And if you take these data and then just consider that looking at the number of copies of each chromosome, of one chromosome in a female, you get something really close to one um, for the variance of the number of offspring of a, a female chromosome in, in a this U.S. Census data. And you, you know, if you go to different places and get different data, you'll get a different variance. But it's not going to be a thousand. It's going to be one or two or three or something. But it's not going to be anything gigantic for humans. And that's one of the reasons that the site frequencies in humans uh, fit this very simple model we've been studying. But if you look at what? Males. Males would have a higher variance of reproductive success, right? That, that's well established, and I'm not sure what the answer is. I didn't get the data for males. So it's a good question, but it would be higher. Yeah. Probably underreported as well. That's right. That's a good point, <laughs> which we will not dwell on. All right, so I want to talk about some organisms that are really different from us, and many of them are, of course. And these are ones in particular that have very high reproductive capacity. And an important thing that will also be um, the role of disturbance, at least in the example that I'll give, in, in creating opportunities for an individual to have a very large number of offspring. And these, these features are common to organisms that produce lots and lots of gametes. And I'll give you an example from marine bivalves, from mussels on the west coast of, the, of North America. <clears throat> oh, and there they are. There's my picture. That's an organism, or two, or lots. Um, this is the California mussel. They grow in the intertidal zone all the way up and down the west coast of North America, from Mexico up to Alaska. And they're all over the place. They grow in these deep, dense carpets. And they have predators like these sea stars here. And <clears throat> here's something about their life history. Um, they reproduce by broadcast spawning. And a single female can produce a very large number of eggs. In fact, each time she produces eggs and sends them into the water, it could be about a million eggs. So potentially, one little mussel could have a million baby mussels if the opportunity presented itself. And the opportunity is that those little guys have to go out and uh, settle somewhere on an open patch of rock in the intertidal zone and then start growing. And along the west coast of North America, there are in the, especially in the winter, there is a very rough seas, big storms, and debris in the water sometimes. And this will knock off big patches. So ecologists have been studying this as a kind of a case example of um, disturbance, the effect of disturbance in uh, species habitat. And they'll go out and measure you know, quadrants on rocks and just check how much got knocked off each year and so on. And so you can get estimates of the size of patches and whatnot from the ecological literature. Another point to make is that mussels are potentially long-lived. Um, 
in the intertidal zone where it's, there's a lot more disturbance, they have a shorter lifespan. And deeper down, where there's less disturbance, they have a longer lifespan. Years. Yeah, those are years. So they have a pretty long lifespan. And so that's a, some suggestion that what I said before is true, that their disturbance could be a major factor in the population dynamic, right? Killing mussels. Uh, there's also more predation probably in the intertidal zone than the subtidal zone. <clears throat> They also show amazingly little population structure. So if you look at FST all the way from you know, Mexico up to Alaska, which is a long way, there's very, very little differentiation between geographic regions in the California muscle. Um, and there's a reference to that. <clears throat> all right, so that's just some uh, notion that one might want a different kind of model. Um, than the standard Kingman coalescent that could try to take into account some of these things. And the basic idea is to account for these events where there's a large number of offspring of a single individual. And again, this is kind of a haploid picture. So a single chromosome here has a lot of descendants in one generation or one time step, right? Um, I'm gonna be working in time steps that are not equal to generations. And I'll talk more about that as I go. All right, this is in the literature already, for especially for marine, marine organisms. Dennis Hedgecock has um, championed this idea, something that's very important for marine, marine organisms, and ca called it sweepstakes reproduction. So it's like a lottery. All of a sudden, you win big because there's disturbance, and you have the capacity to fill that habitat patch. This has big consequences for genetic variation. And one way to think about that, like I've been trying to get across in these lectures, is to Think about the underlying gene genealogy, right? So the differences are, like I said, instead of just binary mergers, we're going to have these events like that, right? So we lose, you can see, we lose some coalescent intervals. <clears throat> they get scrunched down to nothing. Another thing that you can't see from this picture, but there will be a difference in the way time happens in the model, right? It'll depend on various factors that, um, well, I'll, I'll get into the details of one model as we go. Yep. Yes. That sh should become apparent in a moment, but the basic idea is that even in a very large population, the variance of the offspring number could be big, you know, comparable, so that a single individual could have a number of offspring on the same order as the population size. So let me talk about this specific model in, in a minute. Did you have a question? Yeah. No, so this is like the other basic standard Kingman coalescent model, a neutral model. So the idea is that every individual has a, the capacity to produce a huge number of offspring. In fact, they do send out a million eggs into the water column trying to reproduce. If the population size is constant, then one out of that million on average will actually be successful. But if I have a big patch created by a storm and a log or whatever that drags across the rock, then I can maybe plant 10,000 individuals on that patch instead. And so there's no select selection. It's just the environment and the capacity of the, of the organism to reproduce. No, because this individual here actually had a number of different offspring, right? So they're descended from her, you know, and so I would need something like that, right? I need to keep track of the branches. Maybe I'm not understanding your question, but let's move on. Um, all right, so here's a little bit of reference to the multiple mergers coalescent literature. Um, there were some initial descriptions around the turn of the century, I can say. <laughs> this doesn't feel right, but there it is. Um, by uh, Sarek Zagatov and Jim Pittman. Um, 
these are pretty mathematical. Um, the Sagathoff paper is more readable for a biologically minded person. Pittman is not readable for any minded person, I would say, almost, um, practically. <laughs> um, uh, this one actually has in it a, a, a dynamical population model like the ones that I've been talking about. Um, and here it's more, oh, sorry, in Pittman it's much more obscure. Um, these papers described a process in which there was only one of that kind of event at any given time. But in fact, as you'll see in the model I'll describe in a minute, there can be models and cases in which more than one of that kind of event can happen at exactly the same time. So there are some references to papers about so-called simultaneous multiple merger. Um, Nick, I think uh, you mentioned that multiple merger, or you mentioned the effect of selective sweeps on gene genealogies. And if uh, you have a model in which there are recurrent selective sweeps, which seems to hold for some organisms, so the data are showing more and more, it could be easily that a model like this is better than the Kingman model. And the basic idea is that the population size is gigantic, so the normal time scale of the coalescent would be very long, and sweeps instead are coming in faster than that. And so coalescent events are being driven by genetic draft rather than genetic drift. And so here's some uh, papers on that. Durrett and Schweinsberg um, studied that in particular. <coughs> Then there's some more mathematical literature that I won't get into here, um, but which is interesting if you're into applied mathematics. And then finally, um, something I did, haven't talked about, right? In, in this coalescent, I can use the coalescent model. It's a really powerful tool for making inferences, and I didn't say anything about it, but you can calculate the likelihood of an entire data set. And so you can use the coalescent equations and dynamics to calculate things that then can be used to infer the parameters of the model. And that sort of thing has been done also for these uh, coalescence with multiple mergers pretty recently. <clears throat> All right, so here's a model, a schematic depiction of a model that's you know, motivated by a situation like I was trying to describe for the California muscle. It's got a lot going on in it, so let's stare at it for a second. The basic idea is that there's a, an event a disturbance event that kills some number of offspring, of some number of individuals in the population. So there will be a number of open places, which are these uh, where these squares ended up. Again, these are parents up here, like usual, and these are offspring. <coughs> there are also um, in this model some potential number of parents, the dark circles here, and their offspring can fill up the empty spaces in the habitat. So you can see that they're connected in this picture by these dashed lines. It's also possible in this model, as opposed to the Wright Fisher model that I described and we all have been talking about, it's possible in this model for an individual to persist through a time step. And that's an illustration of the fact that I'm not, the time step does not correspond to a generation. If I took this model and said, okay, every generation I kill off all the parents and all of the individual parents were these dark circles, then it would be exactly the right Fisher model. I can make it into a right Fisher model by doing that. Nope. That's just an individual who could have had an offspring but didn't. Yeah. Randomly. Hmm? That one did not persist. Yep. Uh, there's one who persisted. Like I said, there's a lot going on in this picture. It may not be the best picture in the world. Um, so I can make this into a Wright Fisher model if I let the kill everyone off, all the parents off, and let all of them have a chance to reproduce both. That's a Wright Fisher model. Um, another model I'll make reference to in this talk is the Moran model. So the Morin model is a different model in population genetics that is meant to um, be a model of overlapping generations instead of non-overlapping generations. And in the Morin model, um, if you think about this one behind me here, um, the idea is that in one time step, only one individual reproduces and one individual dies. The simple Morin model, I just pick an individual to reproduce completely at random from the parental generation. 
pick an individual to die completely at random from the parental generation, make an offspring from, from the one that, who reproduced, and let it replace the one who died. That's a Morin model time step. I can make that model in here too, right? If I let this number um, be one and that number be one, then it's a Morin model. So I can have these two different kinds of models in population genetics at two extremes in this more general model here. And just one thing to say, I, this is going to be important in, as I go. Um, Sorry. So this is I just wanted to make the point that in the Morin model, the time scale for, for which I would have to uh, rescale time from these steps uh, into the coalescent intervals is proportional to n squared instead of n. And in the Wright Fisher model, it was proportional to n, right? But in the Morin model, because I'm only killing one individual and having one reproduction event every time step, it's going to take on average n time steps to, for the whole population to turn over. So I have a dependence on n squared in the time scale when I want to convert from time steps to coalescent intervals. Another thing to say, I mean, you could calculate the coalescent probability in the Morin model, and it would be proportional to 1 over n squared instead of 1 over m, like it is in the Wright Fisher model. <clears throat> All right, so there's a lot going on. There's a lot of parameters. Population size, and I am going to be thinking of this being very large. There's a probability of a disturbance event in any given time unit, one of these steps. I'm subscripting some things here by N, capital N, because um, we're going to take a limit. And I just want to note dependence of different parameters assumed in the model in this limit. Uh, X is the number of individuals that die in a disturbance event, and Y is the number of potential parents of the offspring to replace those X and individuals. So X for uh, size of the disturbance and Y for the size of the parent population. Then in taking limits, I have these other parameters here. Uh, epsilon still the probability of a disturbance event per unit time. Uh, Phi as the um, fraction of the population, no longer the number, but what will, will be important is the fraction of the population that is replaced in any given disturbance event. And this is, Kavita, to, you, to get to your question, that I'm assuming that a fraction of the population is replaced in a given time step. That's what a big event means here. And then finally, the number of parents. Uh, in the limiting model will just be y. Yep. In the Moran model, in this one, one individual dies and one individual reproduces. Yep. In this model, in this model, x individuals die and Y individuals reproduce. And they could be anywhere from one up to the total population size. Yeah. Other questions? All right, so here's a simple example of this model um, where Y is equal to one. So there's one individual who is, a, is a, a potential parent. And that individual can replace a fraction of the total population. Has a very large number of offspring. <clears throat> the probability of um, uh, sort of the background process going on, the probability that when when none of that no event like that happens, uh, in the background there's a Morin model. That's why it's important to have the time scale here. If there is such an event, then I have uh, I make a little diagram like I've been making, where one individual. <clears throat> Uh, replaces some fraction of the population. And so you can sort of see um, if, if epsilon is really small, right? Super, super, super small. In fact, let's say smaller than 1 over n squared. 
then I'm going to have to wait greater than n squared time steps to see a disturbance event in this model. And then what should happen is I should revert to the Morin model. And the Morin model has a Kingman coalescence as its limiting ancestral process. If epsilon is bigger, so <coughs> So if it's, if it's greater than 1 over n squared, then I'm going to see these disturbance events coming in faster than the normal rate of coalescence in the Kingman coalescence. And so these events will take over the, pop the population process at that point. If I had epsilon equals exactly to proportional to 1 over n squared, then both disturbance events and Moran model reproduction events would occur on the same time scale. And so I need to think about epsilon carefully when I analyze this model. It's going to subdivide itself into different cases depending on how fast those events come in. And remember the muscles, remember the age, uh, average age of muscles in the intertidal zone where there's lots of disturbance is a lot less. This implies that disturbance actually is driving population turnover in California muscles. And so that's the motivation for looking at models, complicated models like this one. All right. So here's an example. Um, so I'm going to assume that epsilon scales like this. So there's n to some minus some power gamma. And so this slide here applies in, in this case. Right? When the, um, the disturbance event is the thing driving population turnover affecting coalescence. <coughs> In that case, I would have this to be the time steps in which I would need to measure time in order to get a coalescent model. Right? And the time scale comes again from what we did uh, for the Wright Fisher model, calculated the probability of coalescence for a pair. Right? And that set how we measured time to get the Kingman coalescent from the Wright Fisher model. And that would be what you would do for any population model in order to get a coalescent process, calculate the probability of coalescence. and um, and uh, invert that to get the time scale, right? The units in which I'm measuring time now. Instead, it's the fraction of the population that's reproduced. And the reason I have p squared there is because I'm thinking of two things coalescing. So they both, when it's a disturbance event driving this, they both have to be captured by the disturbance event, right? They have to be in that population, part of the population that was born in that time step. All right. Um, there ends up being a weaker than linear dependence if I calculate the mutation parameter that would be appropriate given the time scale of uh, this coalescent process. It's not uh, 2NU, which would be, this is a haploid model um, that I'm working with here. This would be 4 if we were dealing with diploids. It's not 2NU, it's 2 gamma minus 1U. So it's something um, different than N in this case, less than n by this power. And then finally, uh, there's a rate of x mergers, which would be mergers in which x lines all come together at once. There used to be just two, and now there can be more than two. It could be at two all the way up to i. The entire sample can coalesce in one time step. And the probability of that is given by this formula here that looks a lot like a a binomial distribution, but it has this extra minus 2 in it, which comes from the fact that I've already scaled time sort of according to pairwise coalescence. And there's a lot more, more technical details behind that, but that's an intuition for where that minus 2 comes from. All right, so that's a, a realization of a process that could look very different than the Kingman coalescence. It's got these multiple merger events, and it's got a completely different time scale driven, again, by disturbance in the model. Here was, is what would happen in the background. Um, and I basically said this already. But if, um, if epsilon is uh, less than 1 over n squared in this particular way with a power n to the minus gamma, <coughs> so that those events recede into the distant past and compared to coalescent events as n gets larger and larger, 
then I would revert to the basic background Moran model, which has n squared over two time steps as the rate of coalescence, as the time scale of coalescence, and two over n squared as a probability of coalescence per time step, and then the usual linear dependence of a mutation parameter on population size, and a rate of coalescent events only, right, two mergers, that is what we had before. So this is uh, the way the Morin model needs to be scaled to get the regular coalescence. And it comes out in this model in a particular uh, case where you make the disturbance events re really, really infrequent. Uh, just a note on modeling mutations in this model, I only, um, to get those thetas, I only consider that um, mutations happen when an offspring is produced, so in, in meiosis, which is um, <clears throat> a, the, the more, um, uh, uh, the replication in meiosis is less, has less fidelity, so we have more mutations there. They tend to be more concentrated on birth events than during lifetime. Okay. So here are some predictions of, uh, just from simulations from this model to give you a sense of how different it is than the, the um, kingdom coalescence. And the first one is, uh, well, it's more of a point just about the total time scale. So this is the total tree length as a function of the fraction of the population that is replaced. So it's pretty intuitive um, as the fraction of the population is, uh, that is replaced gets bigger and bigger and bigger, the total tree length gets smaller. I'm shrinking the trees by making them collapse faster by having a greater fraction of the population that I often get replaced. And this is under that same case a couple, from a couple of slides ago. Here's one that's also interesting. So this is the uh, t total, so the total tree length of a coalescent tree averaged over simulation, simulation replicates um, relative to a sample of size 5. So there's a sample of size 5 and there's what you would get um, for the uh, regular coalescent, the Kingman coalescent or standard neutral coalescent. And this solid curve is the one that we found, right? In fact, you did as a problem the other day expected total tree length, and it has this kind of log dependence on, on sample size. And these other lines are from simulations. So this is when 5% of the population is replaced, uh, 0.275 and so on, up to 95% of the population replaced. And so what's going on? I had a very different dependence on, on a sample size. This says, in a, if I had a situation like this, then there would not be a diminishing retur returns on sampling more individuals if I'm looking to discover more variation. In the standard population genetic models like the Wright-Fisher model, we level off pretty quickly and so people say, well, okay, I only have so much money, I, I don't need to spend this money on sequencing more individuals, I'll do something else with my research money. But here, uh, I would want to keep sampling. I would keep discovering variation. And why is that? Um, it's because the trees are shaped not like the Kingman trees, where it would have these, um, remember the standard coalescent model produces trees that look something like this, or trees in the Wright Fisher and Morin model look like this, and I keep sampling and I get these little tiny branches. If you think of 95% of the population getting killed off at one of these events, a lot of the times what's gonna happen is you'll get back to that event your entire sample is going to coalesce, right? So it's a lot more like this. And so if I sample another individual, I'm going to have the time to the root of the tree times theta over two expected number of extra mutations I would find. And, I, and so it's a very, very different dependence um, than in the standard coalescence. Here's some predictions about site frequencies. This is a, a, a graph in which I've varied the number of potential parents. This is a much easier one to see. So here is, um, uh, oh, and, and half of the population gets killed off, just for um, illustration. So in a sample of size 50, this is the site frequency distribution, and it counts of numbers of uh, sites at which a mutant is found in I bases. And uh, when you kill off 50% of the population and make it coalesce, you get a hump in the site frequency distribution around half of the sample size. And when you, 
have two parents, then that mode uh, shifts over a little bit. And one point to make is that as the number of potential parents gets larger, um, here I just go one, two, five, here's one, two, five, same data, um, but then 10, 40, and the infinite equivalent. As the number of parents gets larger, even if it's not gigantic, you get site frequency distributions that are very similar to the infinite case, which came from the co regular coalescent. It's the same as the regular coalescent. So that tells you that you know, even if I had this kind of process, a really extreme version of it, where half the population is turning over e at each disturbance event, if the number of parents is reasonably big, it's going to look a lot like the kingdom coalesce, which is something interesting. It's a good, I mean, this, this is not a really easy graph to look at, but um, so this is the infinite case there for singletons, and that's 40 for the number of parents equal to 40. It's pretty close, right? And so there is um, doublets. Yeah, at the right graph, or, you know, even over here, um, too, if you had Tajima's D on this curve here, it would be very significantly positive. They have way too much mass in the middle and very few singletons. Other questions before I go on? Great. So here are some California muscle mitochondrial DNA data that I um, applied a really simple minded inference method to using this model as the background statistical model. Here, uh, so the data are from this paper by uh, Ort and Pogson in Evolution, I believe, in 2007. And they sequenced um, 2,300 base pairs of the female mitochondrial DNA lineage. These have two different, muscles have two different, at least California muscles, have two different mitochondrial DNA lineages, a male one and a female one. And this is just for the female. And they did it from 87 individuals. If you make a tree from the data, it looks like this. So it's a lot like this situation over here, and not so much like that one. Say, say again? The outgroup. Um, I don't know if they used an outgroup. I think this here is actually the data in the data. So it's a tree not exactly like this one, but it, it, it's like that, right? With a little more structure. I mean, there's not a a total absence of structure in here, but it's a very, very different shape than you would get um, under the standard neutral coalescent model. All right, so this is, like I said, really simple-minded. And I mean, I should say at the outset that um, what I'm gonna do is fit the model to these data, right? And, uh, and it's going to be simple, but it's also dumb in a way because I'm really, I've really just got one locus here, this mitochondrial DNA data set. If there were selection, for example, we talked about selection and recombination. If recombination rate is zero, as it is in the mitochondrion, then any selection event that happens would um, affect the entire chromosome, the entire mitochondrial genome. And so a selection event could also produce a pattern exactly like this. And what I'm gonna do instead is forget that, ignore it, and just fit these data, imagining that the whole thing is due to neutral um, processes. But still, just for illustration, here we go. Um, uh, I counted the total number of segregating sites and the number of singleton polymorphisms. So those are the ones where the mutant is in one base. And they did have an outgroup. It was another muscle. Um, and I don't remember which one it was. Then I'm going to sample uh, genealogies by simulating under the model in this particular version. So it's the one we've been staring at. One parent produces a huge number of offspring, some fraction of the population, and that's the kind of event that dominates the ancestral process. There's no Moran model or regular kind of coalescent events in it. Uh, so, Simulate many, many genealogies and calculate the probability of getting those two things. So when I uh, simulate under the model, I make trees 
they have a certain total tree length and num length of external branches that would have one descendant in the sample if a mutation happened on them. So I simulate a tree, get a Poisson number of mutations on the branches and discount the number of singletons and the number of total polymorphisms and use that fraction of the time that I get, uh, sorry, that I give those, use those likelihoods for each point in a grid of values of C and theta. This is what happens for these particular data. So here's N is equal to 87. The sample size is 87. There are 142 singletons out of 229 segregating sites, which is a lot more than you would expect under the standard coalescent model. In fact, here's the, uh, here is what you would expect under the standard coalescent model. What you would do, just a simple-minded version of this, is estimate theta from the number of segregating sites, which I could do using the equations that we have learned about. And I would get 45.5. And remember that theta um, divided by i is the expected number of site frequencies, i site frequencies. So theta is the expected number of singleton polymorphisms. Uh, in the standard neutral coalescent model. And so I get, might get a rough estimate of that expected value, about 45.5, and the data shows something very different, right? 142. If I do this uh, really simple-minded estimation routine instead, then I get these estimates, um, which are given by that X here. This is a likelihood surface, and the uh, contours are drawn such that the first one is the approximate joint 95% confidence interval for those two parameters. And the estimate of theta is about 0.28, and the estimate of this fraction of the population that's uh, replaced is about 0.1 or 10%. And then if I take those estimates and just run them through my program and simulate data again, I get an average number of segregating sites equal to 231 as opposed to 229 in the actual data and 136 as opposed to 142 for singletons um, in the data. So that's basically all I had to say about this. Um, large variance in offspring numbers leads to these multiple mergers coalescent processes and they're very different than the Kingman coalescence. I think it will make sense in some organisms, ones that are driven by where the population turnover is determined largely by disturbance factors and can have, a, and the organisms can have a very large number of offspring. One might want to use this kind of model, right? I don't think I've, you know, the muscle example I don't take as um, validating this in any way. It was just an example, but uh, when you do fit it, it, and the background story is sort of convincing for muscles, but what you would really want to do is go and get some multi-locus um, genomic data from these guys and see if the pattern across the genome looks anything like this model predicts as opposed to the kingdom coalescence. All right, that's basically it for that. I have a couple of other things to say about multiple mergers. So maybe we could move this up. Can we move the screen up? Thank you. Thanks. So I just want to spend the last few minutes um, showing you some results on classifying coalescent processes based on simple things you can calculate from a model. And it's work that is largely driven by Martin Miller and other colleagues like Sarek Sagatov, whose paper I cited up, uh, on one of the slides. 
and there's some really neat work uh, that they've done showing that you can understand which kind of coalescent process you're going to get from a model just by calculating some relatively simple things. And one of them is something we've already calculated. I'm just going to write that. So this is just the probability of coalescence of a pair. Right? We calculated this for the Kingman model. Uh, the, sorry, the Wright Fisher model that then gave us the Kingman style coalescent or the standard neutral coalescent. <coughs> So, right, all of this is um, as n gets large. So when I draw arrows down here, that's what is meant. <clears throat> Just for instance, uh, in the Wright Fisher model, we calculated this thing to be equal to 1 over 2n. And so in the limit, it would that would be zero, right? So this is the probability that if I take a sample of size three, that they have a single common ancestor in one time step in the model, right? This is the event that if I take a sample of size four, that they have two distinct parents in one time step in the model. So you can see how that would happen easily in the Wright Fisher model. I take a sample of size four, I throw the first one in a bin, I throw the second one in the same bin, that would be probability one over two n, throw the third one in a different bin, and throw the fourth one in the same bin as this third one, right? Um, it would have a small probability in the Wright Fisher model, and it would be small just like that would be small. All right, first of all, if C0 is equal to 0, then it will be appropriate um, to have a continuous time limiting ancestral process, just like we did for the Wright Fisher model. So I could rescale time because my coalescence probability is going to zero, and I can rescale time by one over the coalescence probability and get a continuous time process. Might or might not be the standard coalescent model, but it could be, uh, yeah, I could get that. In contrast, if this is not equal to zero, then I'm going to be still uh, in the discrete time mode. So how would that happen? Um, make a, I'll make, make a fake example just to illustrate. Let's say there's a right fisher population, but there's only one male. So if there's only one male and I take a sample, there's always going to be a chance of coalescence in every generation that's not negligible, even if the population size of females, it goes to infinity. Right? So there I would be stuck in discrete time. If I'm in a, a this continuous time mode and um, the rate of three mergers goes to zero, sorry, oh, sorry, I did something wrong. That's why I should have notes in front of me. You're going to have to erase your notes. I'm going to just draw it in over here. These are ratios. This is a super important point. So these are ratios of the probability of 
fancy coalescent events to the normal coalescent events, the ratios of those probabilities. Um, let me just make sure I got that right. Here's another mistake. I've been known to make mistakes on the chalkboard. So this is the ratio of the rate of triple mergers to binary mergers in a single time step. And this is the rate of uh, these simultaneous mergers to triple mergers in a single time step. And the nice thing about the work that's in the papers of these guys, I can give you references to it if you're interested, really mathematical, but they did a lot of work showing that this is all you had to do to calculate the, um, to know about the limiting ancestral process and which type it falls under. You don't have to do anything else at all. You don't have to worry about higher moments, actually. And this holds for just for the exchangeable population models that we've been dealing with. All right. So with that, um, we can make sense of this one, right? So this one goes to zero. We're in a, a continuous time world, but the ratio of these things goes to zero also. So triple mergers disappear in relation to binary mergers. And that's exactly what happened in the right Fisher model. The triple mergers would have had probability proportional one to one over n squared, and the binary mergers proportional to one over n. Right? So that goes to zero. In this case, I would have a coalescent with so-called asynchronous multiple mergers. And so let's look at that. We're in uh, continuous time. Um, this is not equal to zero, right? So these guys are not negligible in comparison to the binary mergers. So I will have some multiple mergers, but the Simultaneous multiple mergers are negligible in probability compared to the uh, regular multiple mergers, a single multiple merge. So in that case, I would have a coalescent process in which this is basically the one that I focused on in the, in the slides, in which only um, a single parent can happen at any of these events. And it doesn't just need to be that we have triple mergers. This result is enough to give me um, the kind of full ancestral process I presented on the slides with any arbitrary sample size where the entire sample could coalesce in one time step. And then just to round things out, um, if C is equal, C0 is equal to zero, and C1 is not equal to zero, and C2 is not equal to zero, this is a coalescent with simultaneous multiple mergers. Right, so just run through it again. Continuous time for sure. These ones are not negligible and this is not negligible. So those are occurring at roughly the same rate, or proportionally the same rate as these, right? So they're not negligible in comparison to those. Then we have a coalescent process with um, simultaneous multiple mergers where these th kinds of things would happen. All right, so that's a lot and um, I just wanted to point it out to you because I think it's really neat that it, one can do that. Um, just checking these things is enough to tell me what kind of limiting scenario I'll be in with respect to these, this broad class of coalescent models that has been described. Um, Yes, yes, so the, um, there's the lambda coalescent, beta coalescence, all of these things are in here, um, mainly down here, right? So those are, those are coalescent processes with simultaneous or, not, not, or asynchronous multiple mergers. Um, the ones you mentioned are, are uh, asynchronous. 
those are particular models in there. So there's there, for example, one can show with branching processes if you assume the distribution of the offspring number has some particular form, it becomes one of these. Um, beta coalescent, for example, corresponds to some particular branching process forward in time. And uh, but there are lots of others, infinite number of other possibilities. Yeah. Next. Well, the, sorry, the, it doesn't mean that the, the probabilities of all mergers will be non-zero. Well, I think so, but I'm not sure actually. So these guys, you know, these are applied mathematicians and they love to study applied math problems. And one of the problems that has captivated these folks that I listed on this, this slide and others too, um, is the question of coming down from infinity. So this is the notion that I have an infinite sample size and I don't know, I don't know enough about these models to know whether they're imagining it's much smaller than the actual population size or not. But in any case, some of these models, in fact, the Kingman coalescence, actually comes down from infinity, so-called. And that means that an infinite sample size will collapse down to a finite sample size in finite time. This is mind-boggling. I don't, I don't get it at all. Um, but I think to prove that sort of thing, you have to make reference to the underlying diffusion processes where you're representing a diffusion process in terms of particles instead. And that's a lot of math that, um, that I don't, I mean, I know of, but I don't know all the details of it. Yes, so your, your model um, does, is an exchangeable model, the one you just des uh, described. And, and so the, these results depend on um, some results for the orders of magnitudes of higher and higher moments in, in all exchangeable models. So I think that's the answer to your question, although with not too many specifics. Yeah. Good, okay. That's basically all I had to say. So um, thank you, and uh, I'd be happy to answer questions, of course, but otherwise we can stop and drink coffee and whatnot. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, good. Thanks. Thanks for bringing that up. So, I, I used a, one example with the muscles in which I, I assumed that. But if you um, certainly what you said could give this sort of process, absolutely. And there is an instance of that in population genetics. People have modeled selective sweeps. So there, you know, a new, a new mutant comes into the population in frequency one over two n, and it quickly spreads across the population. In each generation, it's only producing some small numbers of offspring, but those expand quickly. And if I look backward in time, if that happens very quickly, then it looks exactly like a multiple merger. So, yeah, it's a good point. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, thanks. Yep. Yeah, so I used that, um, made reference to variance of the a number of offspring, and I, but I didn't calculate it. That could be an exercise, uh, calculate the variance of offspring number for one of these models. Um, you would show that it, it's very big, very, very big. So I didn't do that. But when an, when an individual can have a fraction of the population as a number of offspring and the mean is one because it's a constant size population, and as n gets large, the variance is going to be very big. Yeah, in practice, I think the, and I, I did make reference to that when I was talking about psych frequencies, that if the number of parents is even 10, you're going to have a tough time. Um, I think in practice, it's going to be pretty difficult. But one area that hasn't really been explored is the dependence on sample size. And I, like when I talked about that pseudo Genghis Khan um, example, it really made a huge difference to take a large sample size and look at the site frequency. So I wouldn't put it completely out of the question that one could distinguish some pretty fine differences between these different processes. But it's going to take a lot of data, a whole lot of data. And I think it would have to come also with a lot of biological knowledge about the particular organism and maybe about how big the population sizes have been for some periods of time and a lot of, a lot of other things. So that's a good point. No, I think, so I think this is a class of models where there will be, um, um, just like when I showed the picture about the average total tree length, right? There's a, there's a real premium on taking larger and larger samples uh, for power to do anything when the models are like this, as opposed to the regular community model. All right, we ended early. Let's go drink coffee. <laughs>